Welcome back. This conversation is part of module four. The time to start with AI is now. I'm joined today by Dalia Hashim, who is the program and research lead for AI and media integrity at Partnership on AI. She'll share with us a little bit about her background and PAI's new AI procurement and use guidebook for newsrooms. Welcome to the uh, to the MOOC. Dalia, how are you? Good, how are you? Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Of course. Um, I think you come to uh, PAI with an interesting background and set of skills. Can you explain your um, what brought you to Partnership on AI in your, in your previous work? Sure. Um, so I did a graduate degree in uh, public policy from the University of Toronto. Um, and from there, I joined the Ontario government uh, here in Canada. And I worked with the open government team on uh, things like open data for, for a while. And then I worked with the Ontario Digital Service on uh, Canada's first um, data and digital law, um, as well as Ontario's first uh, set of AI principles uh, of ethical use and transparency. Um, and so that got me really interested in AI um, and wanting to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper, which led me to my current role at Partnership on AI working specifically on AI and journalism and more broadly, as you mentioned, on AI and media integrity. That's great. And you guys have a local newsroom focus, is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we are, our work stream is focused on AI and local news. Um, our work is funded by a night uh, grant um, and to kind of specifically focus on the responsible adoption of AI in local news. And the idea is, is that if local news uh, is able to adopt AI responsibly, that might uh, help with their sustainability and longevity and, and help with their growth as well. Um, and so that's kind of the angle that we come at it from. And, and we're very interested in um, the responsible part and responsibly high adoption. Great. Uh, and you just produced a procurement guidebook for newsrooms. Can you describe a little bit about what's in it um, and why you decided to create it? Sure. So I think one of the things that we heard a lot from folks in uh, local news and in journalism more broadly is, you know, maybe you sold us on this whole AI thing, or we've heard from other people about all of the AI tools that are available. How do we go about actually picking the tools that make sense for us? And what does responsible use mean when you actually put it into practice, when you're thinking about um, using, developing, or uh, procuring AI tools, um, what does that process look like? And so we kind of sought out to put ourselves in um, the newsroom shoes or in a journalist's shoes and say, what what does mapping out that process from beginning to end look like? Um, and so from when you're considering which tools you should adopt, and more importantly, which problem you're trying to address within your newsroom or which area of growth do you think can be supported by an AI tool? first identifying that within your newsroom to how to choose a tool, what kind of resources are available for you to kind of view the, the whole array of tools that, that are available for newsrooms. Um, what questions should you be asking from the developing company? How can you narrow down what tool makes sense for you? And then how do you develop the governance um, in place within your newsroom to make sure that you have responsible stewardship of the AI tool once it's implemented within your newsroom? Um, and so internal governance is kind of a big piece of the, the guidebook. Um, and then finally, kind of what questions should you be asking to determine um, whether or not that tool has, you know, needs to be reconsidered, needs to be retired, um, you know, maybe a couple of years from now, um, just to kind of walk people through the entire life cycle of AI adoption and, and use from consideration all the way to like retirement and everything in between. Right, because tools don't stay the same, right? They have to be reconsidered as they evolve. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's kind of um, something that applies to most tech, but specifically and especially to AI, uh, because it evolves uh, and because it can change either from the developer who has created the tool themselves or through the data inputs that you update the tool with or um, just in general in, in how your newsroom is using it. So because of all these externalities that come with using an AI tool, this idea of governance becomes that much more important. The idea of maintenance becomes that much more important and um, monitoring how the tools outputs affect kind of the, the journalism products in a newsroom um, becomes uh, very, very important. And, and that's something that we really wanna emphasize um, within the guidebook as um, 
you know, being equally, if not more important than which tool you choose. I think we kind of focus on that piece uh, quite a bit because we're like, oh, like we're, we're investing money, we're buying something or we're investing money to develop something. So we kind of emphasize that part of the decision making process. Um, and so the guidebook really encourages folks to even think of, of, of the other side of that now that you've adopted it and of what does the rest of its life cycle look like? And how do we not kind of fall into that path dependency of because we at one time made a decision to include this tool that we don't consider whether or not we should continue to include it, you know, once a year, once every six months or however long that interval looks like um, so that you ensure it's still serving your newsroom in the way that it needs to. Yeah, I mean, people, once, they, once they've invested time and money, they don't want to go back. So I think the impetus to stay is, is high. Um, but if you have somebody thinking about, like, should this be retired um, or should we look at it in a different way? I think that that's a really good um, component of, you know, the guidebook is great and it has a lot of advice. But if there are, if you had to narrow it down to, let's say, two most critical things to ask or to think about with um, tool procurement, for you, what it, what are those most two critical things? Um, I would have to say, like, just the first step of the why. Why are you looking to adopt an AI tool? Um, and I think that reasoning is really important because it follows you throughout the entire process of, you know, choosing a tool, of, of uh, you know, implementing its governance, all of those, like, wonderful things that we talked about earlier. Um, all of that starts with the why. If the why isn't clear, then any tool can then become, you know, the new shiny thing that a newsroom might want to adopt. But if the why is clear and you're clear on the fact that you need a tech solution to that problem that you've identified or that gap that you've identified within your newsroom, then you can kind of go ahead and try and find, um, you know, the tool that, that might help you fill that gap. Um, but if the why ends up being a cultural problem or a process problem, no tech tool is going to solve for that. So you're going to end up spending all this money and you're going to end up in a place where, you know, maybe yes, there's like a, an improvement in metrics or whatnot, but the core problem is still there. So I think the number one thing I, I would emphasize is, is the why beyond, behind why you need a tool. Um, and then the second thing uh, I would probably say is, is um, after procurement, the governance. Um, so um, who is responsible for the tool within the newsroom? Who's making the decisions around it? In what instances is it going to be deployed? Are there any no-go areas? Is there any human oversight? All of those kind of are parts of what we consider, uh, you know, AI governance um, for a tool within a newsroom, and I think that part is is very important as well. Thank you. Um, that helps boil it down for me to think about, um, especially the the guidance part, and to have somebody um, uh, or the governance part, having somebody uh, somebody really thinking about these tools every single day. Um, you know, the AI ethics and tools. I mean, what do you think about? Um, what's your advice for rec uh, for what to disclose to an audience if you're using a tool to produce um, something? I mean, does it get as granular as like we used a head? We used a tool to create this headline. Do we need do we need that kind of um, disclosure to the audience, or is it is it story generation or image generation? Um, I think that's that's a decision that needs to be made uh, within a newsroom. And that's a conversation that should be had within a newsroom. I think um, there are no assumptions when it comes to AI tools. And I think that that's something that's important to emphasize from the get-go is that a lot of these things need to be intentional decisions. And, and that's one of the things that we really encourage from uh, using the guidebook is to turn all these uh, kind of landmark points of, you know, are we going to be transparent with our audience? What does that look like? Into very intentional decisions that a newsroom should be making in uh, consultation with the journalists, in consultation with maybe even the lawyers in the newsroom, if that's like something that's within the, the newsroom capacity. Um, so um, I think that that is going to vary slightly from newsroom to newsroom and, and is going to vary definitely depending on the tool. Um, using Grammarly within a newsroom is inconsequential almost at this point everyone uses Grammarly um, but using you know to your point an, an image generation uh, tool um, is, is fairly consequential right that's something that people are going to really care about um, and and the spectrum within that is is wide um, but uh, all of this is to say we often say start with considering how impactful this tool is on uh, the the reader or or the user's experience um, is it audience facing? 
Um, and if so, does it impact uh, directly their experience of the news? Um, that's a good place to start to consider whether or not you should be um, transparent about it. The thing that I've seen quite a bit um, within newsrooms is if this is something that um, is readily affecting the audience. So if, for example, part of an article is being generated by um, a, uh, uh, a bot or a automated writer, um, then being very transparent about that in every instance where the automated writer is used is um, encouraged and, and fairly common at this point. Um, so you'll see people accrediting uh, the auto writer in, in the byline or, or along with the, with the journalist or, or what have you, um, or letting people know at the end, hey, like this story was, you know, generated in, in uh, with the support of, you know, this auto writer or, or what have you. Um, and that's important in building trust with your audience. And that's that's key, uh, key currency for, for journalists. Um, so that's one part of it. And then the other part is sometimes when it's a little bit on the back end, so it's not directly facing the audience, um, there is merit to still being transparent about it. So what you'll see sometimes is that newsrooms will um, kind of create like a, a mini page on their, on their website, say, here's all the instances in which we use AI within our newsroom uh, that you might be interested in, and this is how we use it, um, just for, for full transparency and disclosure. And in that case, you don't have to disclose it with every news product that you create, but there is a place for people to find out more if they're interested on how you're using AI for what purposes uh, and so on. So any um, interesting use cases that you've seen in terms of transparency, um, uh, like notifying uh, users of, of generative AI, I, for instance, for Neiman Lab, they have a hero image now that they're using um, and they say that it's from mid journey and they even give the prompt in the cut line, which I think is, is interesting. Um, do you know of any other um, efforts at, of transparency by newsrooms that, that you feel like is, is um, something other newsrooms should think about? Yeah, I, th I think there's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's a couple of newsrooms that I've seen um, crediting uh, an auto writer if, if they are using it fairly regularly and writing news in the byline, so it's very clear. And then it can link out to another page that kind of gives a further explanation about how they're using that specific uh, auto writer and in what instances. And uh, even at times reassuring the audience that like a human has still looked over this article, it, it wasn't kind of published on its own. Um, I've also seen uh, kind of uh, similar to like the, the New York Times website and, and others kind of have like a page, as I mentioned, with all of the ways in which they're using an AI tools within uh, their newsroom, um, just to give folks an idea of, uh, you know, the, the various areas in which uh, AI tools might touch the final product that they're seeing. Um, so I think those are um, not just fairly encouraging and, and trust building ways to, to interact with your audience. Um, I think oftentimes uh, newsrooms are also pleasantly surprised to see that people prefer to know and prefer to kind of know upfront as opposed to um, finding out later on because you know there was a retraction and and, and, and then you know, the newsroom is then blaming the the auto writer or something like that on the mistake that happened. Um, and so I think that a lot of the hesitancy from the transparency is, you know, well, you know, how are people going to react? What's, what's the reaction going to be? Um, and I think so far it's, it's been fairly uh, positive. So. Great. Um, any final um, thoughts in terms of the procurement guide or um, even I know that um, Partnership on AI has a monthly call to uh, bring people in to talk about topics like this. I, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, a couple of things. Um, the procurement guidebook is um, going to be available in, in its final format um, in October. So um, if you're interested in that, keep a lookout for it. Um, the, the second thing is to say that uh, a lot of our products are a um, are, are living documents. So if there's something that you would like to add to any of our products, including the guidebook or the AI tools database, if, if you take a look at that and you see any tools that are missing or whatnot, these are all living documents, so we encourage folks to, to get in touch with us uh, about those. Um, and then uh, to your point, um, we have a community of practice that meets monthly. Um, and the intention from this community of practice is to bring folks together um, from newsrooms, from uh, the, an academic background, from a tech background. Um, if you work in the news kind of ecosystem, we would love to have you. Um, and uh, the intention behind it is for all of us to learn from each other. So if you have a use case in which you've used um, AI tools 
or if you have uh, questions uh, about using them or, or um, procuring them, uh, bring those to the community of practice and it is a discussion and support space uh, that's open to everyone. Yeah, I really like for the procurement guide, you really put it out there for like a month, month and a half just to get people's input. And I love that because it says in action, this is not an edict. This is not from on high. This is us coming together as a community to decide this and that we will iterate as this space is sure to change. Yeah, yeah. And and um, we were very lucky to have a, a steering committee that is fairly multidisciplinary, provide their input into that guidebook. Um, including yourself, Amy, we're very thankful to have you. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think that between that and having it out for, for almost a month now to kind of get everyone's uh, feedback and input, we're hoping that it really just doesn't reflect only my thoughts and in my research, it reflects the community and then that folks really do derive benefit uh, from using it. Right. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.